But here the second one is due to concentration. So in other words, the concentration becomes much stronger in the second one, and it has to, because it still has to become stronger yet. The internal confidence which arises is a very important part of the second jhana, and because of that, one should never skip it in the process. It's strangely enough, the one that many people do skip, not intentionally, of course, because one wouldn't do that, it would be foolish, but because we are not used to having inner joy. Most people don't even know what it's like. In fact, they've probably never even used the word before hearing about the second jhana. Now here in the wording, it says rapture and happiness due to concentration. From a practical standpoint, what happens is that the rapture, which is the delightful sensation of the first jhana, sticks around. That factor is there. PT is there. But in order to come from the first to the second jhana, one has to let go of the attention on that very delightful sensation which overrides the emotion. Let go of that. Let it go into the background of the attention. In other words, do not consider it so important anymore. And put the full attention on what is translated here as happiness and what I prefer to call joy. It's just a matter of translation. It's a joy because we are enjoying this delightful sensation, the state of mind we're in, where the delightful sensation was the aspect of the meditation, and having enjoyed that to the full, we now put our attention on that enjoying. From a practical standpoint, again, it very often appears as if it came out of the center here. And very often it appears to have um, a quality of being a little fountain. Now, none of that is entirely necessary. Whatever happens is fine as long as it's joy. Um, again, the Buddha says that we need to completely cover ourselves with it. And the body is being used because this is the only rev reference point we have. It's the only reference point for what we're doing. So we feel the joy suffusing us, uh, us from head to toe. Very often, or for some people, it is just a natural progression from one to the next. And which is, of course, the case, because if one enjoys something very much, the joy is there. However, because the physical sensation can be extremely strong, it is just as well to deliberately focus on the emotion. And in other suttas where the jhanas are explained, the Buddha says also, that re uh, recognizing the fact that this is still gross because it is a sensation, we now go to that which is more fine and more subtle, which is the emotion. Which means that we recognize the fact that we are not meditating in order to have delightful sensations, which is logical, but when one is in it, one it's not uncommon that one has to be reminded of it. Most people have an inner urge to go further. It's very rare that anybody would be satisfied with that. However, that too happens, particularly in cases where people have meditated for over 20 years and never got anywhere at all and then finally get there 
and then of course they're very happy and so they take that as a as a landing point but it is otherwise quite uncommon to be satisfied with delightful sensation particularly because we have already noticed that they too are impermanent and that although they have a residual effect on us we cannot take them with us constantly we come back to our ordinary everyday kind of consciousness so it is quite all right to deliberately focus on the emotion which means nothing but a change of focus both are already existing the five factors of the first jhana where initial and sustained application the delightful sensation the pt the happiness sukha and the one pointedness so they are all there however it's a change of focus instead of having the mind focused on the sensation and takes it off that let's that go in the background where it will be and focus on the emotional aspect which is existing at that time because this particular state of meditative pr- progress brings inner self confidence it is of course important the inner self confidence arises out of the understanding that here we have a way of happiness which is completely independent from outer conditions we no longer have to search for an outer condition that will bring us happiness that search is sometimes successful and often not even if it's successful it doesn't last and besides one is a victim because we do not have any jurisdiction over outer conditions to the last degree we can make some of them happen sense contacts but we can never make sure that they remain that way there's always disappointment somewhere and being dependent upon the emotions or thought processes of other people which is usually the case in order to find happiness with other people is again a kind of situation where one becomes a victim one can no one cannot be in charge of one's own inner happiness here we have then found the way to have inner happiness strictly because of the condition of concentration this is still conditioned it's certainly not unconditioned but at least it's a condition which we ourselves can make arise we don't have to wait for anybody to be nice and pleasant to us we don't have to wait for anybody to praise us to appreciate us to love us we don't have to wait for any sense contact to be pleasing all we have to do is sit down and become concentrated and since there is nobody that has um a functioning mind cannot be concentrated everybody can do it it's a matter of time it's also a matter of determination and quite often a matter of overcoming some karmic obstructions but everybody that has a functioning mind can do it it is also interesting that over the years it has often um appeared that people who do them the jhanas in the meditation uh, courses then remember having done them as a child it's not uncommon at all and in the buddha's case this was also so when he was about 12 years old his father who was the 
king of a small kingdom, went out for the plowing festival. And the plowing festival is one of the festivals which is still in uh, use in many of the Asian countries. It means that the king or maybe just the um, mayor of a district will go out with a well-decorated plow and turn over in spring the first sod and then monks uh, chant blessings and the whole um, neighborhood is there to take part in that blessing. Well, the father did that. He went to the plowing festival and he took the 12-year-old crown prince along and he was supposed to also have a hand on that plow to be sort of part of this festival. But when it came time for the father to go with the plow and turn over the first sword, the son could nowhere to be found, was nowhere to be seen. So he sent out one of his ministers to find him. And he finally found him sitting under a tree, meditating. Now this minister, having grown up in that kind of environment, immediately recognized that the boy was meditating and did not disturb him, which in our society probably would not have happened. We probably would have, would have scolded him and told him, what are you sitting there doing? Nothing. So he went back to the father and said, your son is meditating. I didn't like to disturb him. And the father said, all right, that's fine. And he went ahead with his plowing festival on his own. When the Buddha then, as he was still the Bodhisattva, left the, whole, the palace and went to study with two teachers to learn the jhanas and was taught what to do, he remembered that when he was 12 years old or when he was a boy, he had sat under that tree and had actually done that. And so it wasn't all that difficult for him to do it again. And this is something that I've been told um, quite a number of times by people who then recognize the jhanas. Of course, they first have to do them again to recognize it, that this was something they did as children. And I would um, guess, it's just guesswork, that far more children do it than we ever find out about. And unfortunately, as grown-ups, they don't get near it again, so they can't repeat it then. It seems to be a quite a natural thing to do. And it's, as I said, possible for anyone. There's nobody exempt from it. This internal confidence which arises because of being happy without outer conditions has quite wide-reaching effects in our daily life. We don't go searching so much for things that can make us happy. On the contrary, compassion impels to try and make others happy. Not through the wrong way of flattery or ex uh, just um, agreeing to whatever somebody is saying, but by trying also to help along this path to find that same happiness. The search for happiness, which is inbred in every living being, has, so to say, found a stage. It's not complete, but it has found a stage where the outer world out there does not seem so enticing anymore. And when it doesn't seem so enticing anymore, it can't be so disappointing. So there's a big change in the inner life. The self-confidence means that one is 
self-reliant for one's own happiness, for one's own well-being. Totally self-reliant without expecting that others have a part in it. If they do, if they're helpful and loving, that's great. But if they don't, it doesn't matter. Because something is within which is already taking care of that. The uh, concentration at this time is, of course, much stronger than at the initial one, at the first one. And it is also more interesting. Although the first one appears very interesting, if one has never had it before, it becomes pretty uninteresting after having had it for 10 or 12 times because it's just well, it's pleasant, but uh, it's still quite physical. Whereas this is emotional. And when one has that the first time, that's also very um, surprising, but also that is, becomes quite normal. It has a sweetness in it, a feeling of sweetness. It has a feeling of having found something. But it's still a bit exciting. The first one is still is quite exciting. It has a bit of excitement in it. And the second one is um, has still has that feeling of excitement in it. I'll read out what the Buddha the simile that the Buddha gave for for it, huh? Great king, suppose there were a deep lake whose waters welled up from below. It would have no inlet for water from east, west, north, or south, nor would it be refilled from time to time with showers of rain. Yet a current of cool water welling up from within the lake would drench, steep, saturate, and suffuse the whole lake, so that there would be no part of that entire lake which is not suffused with the cool water. In the same way, great king, the meditator drenches, steeps, saturates, and suffuses his body with the rapture and happiness born of concentration so that there is no part of the entire body which is not suffused by this rapture and happiness. This too, great king, is a visible fruit of recluseship of spiritual life, more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. that there is no inlet for water from east, west, north, or south, nor could it be refilled from the showers of rain. Yet there is this current of cool water. Nothing comes from outside. There is no outside input into making a person happy. It's all coming from within. That's a simile of that. And then there's this cool water which wells up from within, the joy which wells up from within, it drenches, steeps, saturates, and then suffuses. If these states arise, first or second, either way, and they're only mild and only very um, local in one spot, it's necessary to enlarge them if the joy is apparently only in one spot, to enlarge it all over. It may be a quick movement, but it can also be a slow, um, gradual movement of the mind to enlarge that. When one is concentrated enough to get into second jhana, one is also concentrated enough to do that. There's no, not difficult at all. The same applies to the first jhana, when the pleasant feeling should be only localized in one spot, sometimes only hands or so, some place like that, to enlarge it so that the whole body is involved. Now, obviously, an emotion is not something that is body-based, but on the other hand, it is the only measure of limitation that we have about ourselves. This is me. 
So this is where we drench and suffuse. The first four of the jhanas are called the rupa jhanas. Rupa means corporality or physical. So that's translated as to the fine material meditative absorptions. Nice long words for rupa jhana. But it's important to know because the first four have aspects which we actually know and are familiar with only in a much less concentrated manner and the quality is by no means as great and also they have to arise from outside conditions. So we all know pleasant sensations, pleasant touch sensations, we all know those. But they are due to an outside source. And also their lengths, the lasting of them, is determined because of the sense contact. Whereas here, the lens is only determined through our concentration. As long as we want to stay on it, we'll stay on it. The quality of it, of the pleasant sensation that we know in ordinary life and the delightful sensation that we know in the meditation is also different. Because this is not caused by an outside agent, it is sweeter. And this is particularly true of the second one, of the joy. Now, we all have been joyful at one time or another about something or another. But because this is not caused through any outside happening, but just comes wells up from inside, it has far more purity in it. And also, we do not have that dependency on anything. So we don't have to keep it, we don't have to hanker after, uh, after it, because we recognize the fact that we have it within. It is in there. And that makes it a much purer experience. So although these four, first four jhanas are states which we are familiar with, and that's why they're called the material ones, but the fine material ones, they are of a different quality. It is interesting that very often people go from the first to the third and are not aware of the second. Not everybody, but it happens quite frequently. And it's absolutely essential to go back and get the second one also. Because this Joy is the, this happiness that was mentioned already as the antidote against restlessness and worry. If we want to have peacefulness within, which is the opposite of restlessness and the opposite of worry, we do have to have the ability to arouse joy within without having to look for any agent. The dependency which we have, as long as we use our senses, is a feeling of insecurity. Fear is a human condition, insecurity is a human condition. That's why the biggest buildings are usually owned by insurance companies. We're always looking for something that's going to ensure our safety. We've got it all within. We don't have to pay a penny for it. It's all free. The reason we can't get at it is because we think too much. Not only too much, but we judge. We um, have negativity in our thinking. We have discrimination between what we like and what we don't like. In other words, we have duality thinking. We're constantly in, enmeshed in duality, 
what I want and what I don't want, what I like and what I don't like, what I'm going to have and what I'm not going to have, and what he has and she has, and so on and so on. The less we have of that in our daily living, the easier it is to get at this. It's all within. It's all existing in there. We cannot possibly put it in. It's all there. We need the peace and quiet and the um, happiness of knowing we're on the right path in order to get to that concentration. If you remember the last section before the Buddha started talking about the jhanas was about the fact that we are so happy because we're sitting there without the hindrances and when the mind becomes happy like that then there's rapture and then there is um, peacefulness in the mind and then we can start getting concentrated. So the less we get the less allow the mind to get upset, to get uh, worried, to uh, have plans, to go by its memories, to have all these ideas that we can conjure up, the less we allow that, the easier to get at it. Eventually, we have to have a pathway which will get us there always. That's why at the end of the meditation, either when the mind's no longer concentrated or when meditation time is over it's necessary to first see that this too is impermanent and then recap what did I do to get there eventually the recap is no longer necessary because we know exactly how to get there but to see that it's impermanent is always necessary because it is also important to know that all the jhanas as desirable as they may be are all worldly states. They are not transcending the world yet. Although they help us to do this, because each one brings insight, it hasn't happened yet. They show us the way, they explain the way quite clearly, but it has to happen. So they are still mundane states. Therefore, we have to know that they too are impermanent. While we may know it, we have to actually experience it while they are slowly dissipating. And therefore it's necessary that should the bell go while one is still in it, not to open the eyes immediately, but to slowly become aware of the dissipation of that state, even though it may have a residual effect, it still isn't as strong anymore as it was. Have the recap and then slowly and gently open one's eyes, move the body, and slowly and gently get up. Slowly. There's no hurry. We're all there already where we want to be. We just don't know about it. That's all. We haven't noticed it yet. The truth is always there. Absolute truth is always within us. Absolute truth is always existing. It's just that we haven't noticed it. That's all. One could compare that to watching a TV. It looks so real, doesn't it? And while we look at it and think it's so real, we become quite engrossed in what's going on there or on the movie screen. But in reality, it's just a moving picture which has been put on a screen, which is always is, whether we know it or not. So the reality is always there, whether we pay attention or not doesn't make any difference. And by the same token, the reality of inner joy is always within us. Whether we know it or not makes no difference. If we have too much other stuff within, we won't know it. But if we can, and especially of course in a retreat situation such as this, it should be easier, if we can let go of a lot of this stuff that we're carrying around and which is nothing but a heavy burden then we will notice that this is there and having noticed it once one should be able to get at it again it's always waiting it's never disappearing now 
because this counteracts restlessness and worry so effectively, we need to stay on it for a little while. As soon as it has arisen, the mind may fall off it again, but we can bring it right back and stay with it for some time. If we have done it many times, we will know exactly where and how to find it. And having found it, to enjoy it, be suffused by it, drenched by it. Again, the mind will know quite clearly that that too is still a bit exciting and that one's really looking for peace. And because having been on this joy for a proper length of time, because of that, the mind is contented and it can let go of the joy and be aware of contentment. That's the third jhana, and I'll read out what the Buddha said about it. Further, great king, with the fading away of rapture, the meditator dwells in equanimity, mindful and clearly comprehending, and experiences happiness. Thus he enters and dwells in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare he dwells happily with equanimity and mindfulness. He drenches, deep, saturates us and suffuses the body with this happiness free from rapture so that there's no part of the entire body which is not suffused by this happiness. All these words are all <laughs> arbitrary translations. The word rapture is meant for the PT, for the delightful sensation. So that goes now. That has been around long enough and because the meditator is completely contented, that part of the factors is now completely subsiding. So that's gone. There is certainly a feeling of happiness still in the mind, but the most, the strongest what is, that is arising is contentment. And this contentment is here mentioned as equanimity. And the word equanimity is unfortunately bandied about in the jhanas too much because we can't distinguish too well if we have it mentioned too often. So I'm not using it. I want to use contentment. But you can see that contentment and equanimity have a certain uh, relationship to each other. But what is actually happening is that the joy, which is something one's always looking for, always looking to be happy, has suffused one to the, con to the extent where contentment arises. And this contentment can be seen and understood in this way, particularly after. And this is also important. One first stays with those emotions and after one is out of them, in that recapitulation, one recognizes what they have meant. So the joy has meant that one doesn't need outside agents. Now the contentment has meant that the only way to become contented is to be without wishes. Because at that moment, when there is this joy arising and has been actually experienced, and one is able to let go of it, there is no wish. One is totally contented. So this is totally opposed to the worldly view. The worldly view is, I'm going to be contented if I'm going to get what I want. And then one makes a list of the things one wants. And then one cross crosses off a few things one has already got, and one may cross off a few things which one thinks, well, they're not that important, and then one remains with those that one has to be in order to be contented. Totally a wrong view. 
As long as one wishes for something, one has dukkha. That's the first and second noble truth, which is the um, sort of the kernel of the teaching. The first noble truth, the noble truth of dukkha, that it exists. And the second noble truth is the noble truth of the cause for dukkha, which is craving, which means wanting something, wanting to have it or wanting to get rid of it. And here we have an absolute proof in our own experience that this is so. That as long as we want something, there's always going to be dukkha no matter what it is, because it means that we haven't got it. So we have something lacking, we're minus something. But here is a situation that has arisen in the meditation which has brought contentment. It has to. Completely, to be completely suffused with joy cannot bring anything else except contentment. It has to. These are logical cause and effect situation. So with that contentment, after coming out of it, one sees quite clearly there's no other way to be contented, to be peaceful, than to stop wanting things, whatever it is. And may it ever look so justified. Even when, pe when one can say, but everybody's got it, only I haven't got it. Well, it doesn't matter. If one wants contentment and peacefulness, one's got to stop wanting. There's no other way. And this, of course, at first may seem strange, but when one has experienced it oneself in the third jhana, it is so obvious that one wonders why one hasn't always acted upon it already. But we don't until we actually have that personal experience. Now, what you can see from these explanations is that we don't just do the jhanas, that is the experience. We have to understand it also, and that is the insight. The experience is the way of calm and tranquility, and the understood experience is a way of insight. So every jhana brings a new insight, and some of them insights which arise may even be more than what I'm talking about and they may be different, but these are the significant ones, the ones which will change our outlook completely. So the personal experience of something that we've always wanted, namely inner joy and contentment, brings about a turnabout in one's approach to one's life, and what life has to offer. Because being contented means also that there is peace in the mind, contentment, the feeling of contentment, slides into peacefulness. Now here, the words, this mindfulness and clear comprehension are used, which means that we need to understand the experience. The mindfulness means that we're staying with it. That's the one-pointedness. But the comprehending is afterwards. That it comes together with the recap or the review, what we have done. So I like to emphasize that once more, that while we're having the experience, we're staying with the experience. After it's over, we have a review of it, and we know what we have experienced. The Buddha also gives a simile for this third one. Now he also mentions that the noble ones declare that one dwells happily with this contentment and mindfulness. So what is the, the main focus is on their contentment and the mindfulness is the one-pointedness. So in this jhana, we still have two of the five factors. 
First we had five factors. Then we lost two factors on the second journal. Now we have lost another factor. We have lost the, the uh, rapture factor. So we still have the happiness and the mindfulness, which is another word for the one-pointedness. This is in the third jhana. We have two factors left. Great King, suppose in a lotus pond there were blue, white or red lotuses that have been born in the water, grow in the water, and never rise up above the water, but flourish immersed in the water. From their tips to their roots, they would be drenched, steeped, saturated and suffused so that there would be no part of those lotuses not suffused with cool water. In the same way, great king, the meditator drenches, steeps, saturates and suffuses the body with the happiness free from rapture so that there is no part of the entire body which is not suffused by this happiness. Now this in the translation does not come about exactly as it does up there because here, up here we had equanimity. It's a matter of translating all these words. So, this too great king is a visible fruit of the spiritual life more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. While the rapture is gone, the happiness is in the background and the foreground is the equanimity, is the contentment. So the, um, each jhana is more subtle, each jhana is more sublime than the previous one. And each jhana brings a change in a person's outlook if one practices them continually. They are all useful for gaining insight. Most people have heard many a time that our dukkha is due to wanting. But when one experiences that the contentment we can get in the third jhana is so much greater than anything we've ever felt before and that it's strictly due to the fact that nothing at all was wanted, then we know it. We always compare that to biting into the mango. If we've never eaten a mango, and we ask somebody what it tastes like, they will probably tell us that it's very sweet, very juicy, very soft, very delicious. Or well, we haven't got a clue what it tastes like until we've bitten into it. Here we bite into it. We know what it tastes like to have no wish. It's the best taste that we can ever get. There is a very interesting simile given in the Visuddhimagga, which is the great commentary, on the jhanas, and I'll give it to you because it's helpful. It says like this, as a person wandering in the desert, having no water, seeing no water, parched, without any resource at all. Well, that's a person that's trying to meditate. And then finally sees some water in the distance and a great excitement arises that his great thirst will be quenched because he can see there's water there. And this is very joyous excitement. Now that's the first jhana. And then, of course, he goes straight to that pond of water. And he stands at the edge. 
And standing at the edge, he is joyful that he can now have the water that he's been looking for. But still excited about it, because now it's going to happen. And then he goes into this water and starts drinking. And now he's contented. And having drunk his fill, he steps out of the water and goes to the nearest tree and lies down in the shade and rests. And that's the fourth one. Having had one's fill, one goes to the fourth one that goes to the rest. So I'll read out what the Buddha said about the fourth one. Further, great king, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous passing away of joy and grief, the meditator enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, which is neither pleasant nor painful, contains mindfulness fully purified by equanimity. He sits suffusing his body with a pure bright mind, so that there is no part of the entire body not suffused by a pure bright mind. What this um, says is that there is no emotion. There is neither a great uh, excitement nor one is uh, exhilarated nor is there any sadness about letting go of the joy or the uh, contentment. The... um, What happens is, from a practical standpoint, the contentment which has already sort of slid into a feeling of peacefulness goes much deeper. It goes deeper and deeper. And although it says here, and it always says, that it's mindfulness fully purified by equanimity, I say that it is the mindfulness is the one-pointedness which has to be there which is the last factor which stays with us in the fourth jhana it is complete and utter peacefulness which results in equanimity which we can use in daily life the equanimity which at least to my way of understanding my own Uh, emotions, equanimity is something that we are aware of. Whereas in the fourth jhana, the peacefulness can be so profound that one wouldn't be aware of the fact that one has equanimity. One would just be there, totally enmeshed and totally surrounded, completely uh, in the depth of this peace. The fourth, so I, I'd like to translate it a little differently in order to explain it that way. Equanimity, as the highest of the four supreme emotions, is a result and a very important one. Because knowing that one can actually have this utterly peaceful state whenever one wants to, when one sits down to meditate, brings great equanimity with it in daily life because that residual effect is such that we know what goes on out there while it may be this way and that way what can it do to that peacefulness in the fourth jhana? Nothing. It has absolutely no effect on it. It is not even connected. Whatever happens out there, whether it is praise or blame, loss or gain, fame or ill-fame, happiness or unhappiness, how can it touch the depths of peace which is within us? There is no connection. So all that, what happens out there, is just happening. And some of it has creates pleasant feelings. And some of it creates unpleasant feelings, but that too doesn't matter. That's all just on the 
surface of our lives. The depth is to be found in the jhana. And that's where we experience the inner reality that what we always knew either consciously or subconsciously that we do carry it within most people know it subconsciously some people know it consciously and that most people don't get it just because they're not shown the way or because they don't practice or whatever it may be so this equanimity is the effect and the equanimity I have already explained that what it means in daily life that it means that although there is a warmth of feeling and a caring for others there is no dependency upon the happenings that go on around us because the warmth and the feeling for others is not affected by that neither is the warmth and the feeling for oneself affected by it whether somebody finds us lovable or not that remains their viewpoint and their opinion and that means that we're no longer a victim but that we have taken our own emotions in hand and when we take our own emotions in hand then of course we have security The name Kema, by the way, means security. It's a translation. I just remembered that. So we gradually and um, progressively let go of the different stage, uh, different factors of the jhanas until we're only left with one-pointedness. Now this one-pointedness does not have then the interruptions that we sometimes even get still in the second jhana and it is, I like to compare it to a deep well where in the beginning at the state, stage of contentment we might be sitting on the top of it dangling our feet into the well and being contented but as we become more and more concentrated and peaceful we go down into the well successively, gradually, progressively until eventually we may be at the bottom of the well at the bottom of the well there's complete and total peace but you can see for already from this simile that it is essential to let go of any self-assertion here in the fourth one even the observer who observes all that is minimized is not disappeared but is minimized because it is such a deep state of relaxation this is the state barring the eighth jhana which brings the greatest energy rejuvenation and regeneration to the mind it makes it therefore a mind which is clear and sharp which can see the connections which can see things as they really are a mind which does not have that kind of one-pointedness and thus because of that does not have the ability to have that regeneration and rejuvenation will not be able to see the depth of the teaching the depth of the teaching is even difficult for people who can do the jhanas never mind for those who can't because the depth of the calm is intrinsically connected to the depth of the insight it means depth of mind a mind which scurries around on the surface is remains on the surface and we can philosophize and we can think and we can logically deduce but that is not going to bring freedom the only way we're going to get freedom is when we can actually feel it 
and the feeling comes from this kind of experience. So the fourth one has as an effect the equanimity, but it also has as an insight the, the understanding that by letting the self-assertion go and making as much self-surrender as is necessary to go into the force means that we can actually gain real peace. So here we have already a taste of what it means to ha do not have the self always in the front wanting and disliking and being in charge of the whole life situation. Letting go of that in charge self means peace. So again we have a very profound insight from that. And because all direction is to use these for gaining that kind of insight, they are far deeper going than just the understanding because we actually have bitten into the mango. We know what it tastes like to be without this self-assertion. The fourth is then that simile where the person lies down under the tree in the shade completely at peace with him or her and the world and being at totally at rest. Because the mind is totally at rest as much or similar to the eight, the eights might be just a fraction more rest, um, it has the greatest regeneration aspect. And the mind, because it gets used all the time, needs to be regenerated. Anybody who has watched him or herself and has been thinking all day, knows how tiring that is. How all one wants is to just skip the whole thing. And so what does one do in ordinary life? One goes to bed, hoping to sleep. But that's not the answer either, because at night we dream. The only answer is to go into the fourth jhana. Then we can skip the whole thing. Actually, all that thinking that we're doing is totally unnecessary, as every meditator should know, because it's nothing but a disturbance. At times, naturally, there has to be something that we have to attend to. But because we can attend to it with mindfulness, it's not that tiring. It's the discursiveness of the mind the restlessness and the worry, the hoping and the wanting that makes it so tiring. And because of that, we have to be have that regeneration. That's a simile, a simile for the uh, fourth jhana again. Oh yes, well one of the things which is said also is that it's a pure bright mind. The fourth is pure and bright. It is the purest of those four because of the fact that all the other factors, the joy and the rapture and the initial and the sustained appearance, they're all gone. Only one-pointedness is left. So that's the purest of those four states, of course, and of course also the deepest. And therefore, it brings also the greatest brightness of mind. Great King, suppose a person were to be sitting covered from the head down by a white cloth so that there would be no part of the entire body not suffused by the white cloth. In the same way, Great King, the meditator sits suffusing the body with a pure bright mind so that there is no part of the entire body not suffused by a pure bright mind. This too, Great King, is a visible fruit of the spiritual life more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. Well, again, the body is used as for the simile, just as it is used in the other simile that one lies down under the tree, because it's all we have. Um, we, it is a completeness of peacefulness, 
at that time the body is not felt but the completeness of being totally and wrapped in the peacefulness is the meaning of this being completely covered with the white cloth from head to toe nothing is left out one is totally in it so it's a suffusing the body with this pure bright mind the purity of the mind is the one pointedness and the brightness comes from the peacefulness the peacefulness is not dull that also has to be remembered when one does these jhanas the peacefulness is bright but bright does not mean that it's light opposed to dark not necessarily anyway it means totally aware totally there that's what brightness means it's not a dullness this utter peacefulness has this has complete awareness in it and yet it doesn't have that much movement as the others have it still has movement but not as as much movement mind movement as the other three had it's very very one pointed it is uh, either possible to just move from one to the other because the mind does it but it is just as valuable to determine to move the buddha says that also the uh, because one realizes that the one one is in is still not as fine as subtle as it could get and since one knows where one is moving to one also knows how to do that there's also a misconception that one shouldn't know about it if i don't know where i want to go it's highly unlikely i'm going to get there one's got to know where one is going and there's no reason to make this a secret the buddha certainly didn't make any secret out of it we have many statues of the buddha where he is depicted with his left hand and the palm the left palm turned out over his left knee and that mudra means that he has taught with an open hand and not a closed fist these are his own words he said i've always taught with an open hand not a closed fist i never kept anything secret so the uh, the teaching is certainly there to be known and to be used and that is again possible for everyone one word may be that may be necessary for those that have not done the jhanas yet please don't look for anything just sit there and be as concentrated as possible first one has to become concentrated if one is concentrated the rest happens now the first one comes from the seclusion of f- from the seclusion from the de- uh, unwholesome states so it is quite helpful to make that determination to see that in oneself that at this point in time there's no unwholesomeness at all and with that happiness comes then also the happiness of that concentration and then just keep on being concentrated that's all whenever thoughts arise let the mind quickly go back to the meditation subject do not follow the thought recognize the fact that thoughts are connected with the world and the world cannot give total satisfaction so let's just leave the world out at the moment and go inward everything we've ever looked for it's all within us there's nothing missing nothing lacking all of us are all that we ever want to be we've just got to get at it that's all all right that's enough on the first four
Are there any questions? Please, this is the time for them. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Do the jhanas blend together? I mean, are they more like, say, a rainbow where the colors blend into each other than like a stair step where there's a distinct jump from one to the other? No, they're quite different. One is quite, they're all quite different from each other. So it's not possible to like slide from one to the other? Yes, it is. It is possible, especially if one is skilled at it. It's quite possible. Right, but... But, uh, Well, like the colors in the rainbow are definitely different from one another. But you can't really point and say, this is where the red ends and the orange begins. It, It just sort of slides into the other color. Well, I would say that as one slides, one doesn't know, but when one has arrived, one knows one's at a different spot. Right. So like if you slid down a rainbow, you would yeah. you would see the red, and then we would know that you'd slid into the green. Yes. Okay. Yes. But at the moment of sliding, one wouldn't be so aware of that sliding. Right. Unless the sliding doesn't happen, then one can do it deliberately. Right. One stuck to the red long enough. (laughs) Okay, what else? Remember, questioning is part of uh, the pathway, yes. Uh, I'd like to know what the recommendation is for a man. How much practice to do in everyday life, you mean? As much time as you've got, I suppose, I don't know. Minimum. Oh, minimum. (laughs) Minimum two hours a day. That's just enough to um, keep the state going that one has achieved in a retreat. Whatever one has, however far one has got, one can just keep that going with two hours a day in, the, in daily life. How about number of retreats? Like, year? <laughs> I have at least 10 to 12 retreats a year. So, I mean, I've constantly retreats. I have nothing else to do. <laughs> so maybe, maybe one, if you, the more retreats one can teach, the more retreats one has. Huh? <laughs> I, I have, I have no way of saying or knowing anything like that also has a lot to do with one's karma, how long it takes. It's got a lot to do with that. A lot to do with one's devotion, uh, all sorts of things. But it's possible for everyone. There's nobody exempt. And uh, you can be quite sure that in all the courses I give, the um, this, uh, people eventually all get to it even though they might not do so in the first course they take, but eventually they will get to it. So, you're supposed to interrogate. Said somewhere along the line here, didn't it? (laughs) (laughs) What else? Yes? The image of the clear, bright mind, I can't agree with you. Does that, when you're talking about the the one-pointedness, does it, is that what they, they sometimes read in, the, in different places, they talk about clear light? And that clear light. And I that think that's a Tibetan expression, and you know, I am absolutely okay. no expert on what they mean and what they say. I really can't say. Clear light, I really don't know. And you see, I would have to know in what context. If they're saying it in context of jhanas, well, yes, maybe. 
I really don't know. But these things all have very specific reference to meditative states. Like I'm. I don't know. I well, I can tell you what I mean. If you ask me what I mean, I can exactly tell you what I mean. I can also tell you what the Buddha meant, but I can't tell you what other people mean. I really don't know. I mean, I wish I could tell you, but I really don't know. In that state, is there actual light? In the fourth jhana? Yes. Well, there is, uh, not in the fourth jhana, but light appears to some meditators at the time when the concentration is happening. And it's actually nothing but a traffic signal. It says, hello, you're being concentrated now. <laughs> and uh, and it is, if it is a really concentration, it should have the um, uh, appearance of either sunlight or a, a strong um, searchlight, but it could be yellowish or white, it can be either one of those. And as it appears as a small point, and if it does appear to anybody, um, one makes it big and sits in it for a moment and then gets on with it. It's not a meditation subject. It's only a, um, a signal saying now concentration. This making bigger, um, is it better to be done slowly and gently or quickly? Or? That depends on one's skill. If one has done it many times, you just do it like that. But if one hasn't done it many times, slowly, gradually, little by little, so that it uh, doesn't pop back. <laughs> so not every meditator sees a light, or, or sometimes one time yes and one time no, but it is actually a, a feature of being concentrated. And one can use it to make it big and sit in it and enjoy it for a moment or for a few moments and then go to the um, jhana. It very often appears before first jhana, but not for everybody. It also depends whether one is visual. People who are very visual, they have a lot more things happening and appearing than others. You know? Does it matter if you're visual or not? Not at all. The whole thing depends on feeling. Not at all. Okay, what else? Yes. Following that, might it also be the case that if a person is visual, that can be a distraction because one gets lost in the... It can be. gets the seeing and gets amazed mm. at the image or something. It can be. It can be a distraction. It can also be helpful depending on how one uses it. It can easily be a distraction if one has too many pictures going on. Okay, anything else? <clears throat> Something that just came to my mind when someone is leaving their body and dying and they said to follow the light. Mm. Is it like instant at that moment the possibility of going into a jhana at that moment of leaving the body? Leaving well, if one is skilled at the jhanas, one would hopefully be doing them when one is dying so that there's no, no question of whether one can go into them. But the Buddha, it is said, went from the first to the eighth, back down to the fourth, and died between fourth and fifth. Because the fine material jhanas, which go up to the fourth, that was not subtle enough, and so between going to the fifth, he, he died at that stage. And Ma Mughalana, who was his left-hand disciple, was extremely psychic. And he said, he told the others that that's what he was doing. So if one, I don't know, I mean, we can't compare ourselves to the Buddha, but uh, if one can do the jhanas and one knows one is dying, one would hopefully do nothing better than that. And then one would die in one of the jhanas. Here's my question, was also if you haven't practiced the jhanas, and yet in all that I read about dying, that 
follow the light. I was just wondering whether it's something that may happen. It can happen instantly. To go into the jhana, I wouldn't have a clue. I have no idea. All I know is that it's much better to practice them now. (laughs) 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 That I know for sure. (laughs) And not wait till the last moment. Yes, Michael. Um, Is the the skill of getting into the jhana something that as years go by, when you continue to practice, you can just do um, almost instantly at will? Yes. Certainly. Um, But uh, the reason I'm saying always, please do a recapitulation how you got in, so that you find your own personal trigger. Now, usually people have personal triggers, um, and there are, you know, some people can use loving-kindness meditation, and it really gets them into it. Some people can use determination. Some people can use um, sitting differently, a physical thing. I had one lady tell me that she has to roll her eyes back. Well, it's all right. I mean, if that gets you in, it's okay, you know. Um, Some people have to actually remember that at this point in time they are without any hindrances and have this joy feeling about it, just as it is said here. So one finds one's trigger, and as you find now, eventually, having done it so many times, you don't need the trigger, you just do it. It's just a matter of um, intention, intention in the mind. The mind intends. Also, I I remember you um, saying one of the unknowable things one was um, the mind of a Buddha and the influence of a Buddha influence of a Buddha and what's one of the, the others uh, the influence of a person in jhana mm-hmm. what, what does that mean same thing uh, a person who can do the jhanas very well and has real concentration certainly has a mind which is like a laser beam and that laser beam, if used properly, can have good resultants. But if it's used in the wrong way, it can also have bad resultants. So, um, if the person is not enlightened. So that's why uh, the Buddha was very much against using powers for people who are not Arahants. So only an Arahant, and he would know exactly, an Arahant would know exactly when to use power. So the mind of a person in jhana has power and that power is is there and whether one knows it or not it's there and we don't we don't need to inquire the Buddha said that what kind of power that is it's uh, not not um, useful yeah is the power only while they're in the jhana or after they come out? Or well, while they're in jhana, it is, of course, a much stronger power. Okay. Yeah. But there is, like, some residue or something? Yeah, certainly. But, uh, again, it is a power which one, um, which is to be used for enlightenment. Right. That's the power. We know that's what it's for. That's why the insight is so much more readily available after mm-hmm. the jhanas. That's right. That power is there it's pointed in that direction that's right and that's what that power should be used for right you know? and then when one is enlightened well then one can do what one likes <laughs> <laughs> and you don't even have to come to any meditation retreats <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yes the imponderables they are called Michael the imponderables the range of a Buddha, the range of a person in jhana, the beginning of the world, and the intricacies of karma. Uh, the imponderables. What yes. is meant by that intricacies of karma? You're trying to figure out your karma? Yes, it's not uh, useful. 
it's not useful to see, well, I'm nowadays, I'm having this sort of life and that's due because in my past life uh, I was a Persian dancer or something like that. It's totally useless, <laughs> you know. It's, uh, the, the karma is so interwoven. There are so many strands to it. We can't find just one reason for one or one cause for one effect. We've got too many causes.